our guest. Uh, Adam Khalil, a member of the Ojibwe tribe, is a filmmaker and artist from Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, whose, att whose practice attempts to subvert traditional forms of ethnography through humor, relation, and transgression. Khalil is a core contributor to New Red Order and a co-founder of Cousins Collective. Khalil's work has been exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art, Sundance Film Festival, Walker Arts Center, Lincoln Center, Tate Modern, Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, Toronto Biennial 2019, and the Whitney Biennial 2019 as well, among many other institutions. Upcoming exhibitions will be held at Gasworks in London, Spike Island in Bristol, and Artist Space in New York City. Khalil is the recipient of various fellowships and grants, including but not limited to the Sundance Art of Nonfiction, the Jerome Artist Fellowship, Cinereach, and the Gates Millennium, Millennium uh, Scholarship. As a filmmaker, Adam has co-directed uh, three feature length films, and not to say, which he made with his brother Zach and which screened here at the Buffalo International Film Festival in 2017, I wanna say, um, uh, but I'm sure we'll correct that. Um, with Bailey Schweitzer, Adam co-directed Empty Metal, a punk rock murder film that mixes found footage, computer generated imagery and digital video in ways that confuse and confront the viewer with a genre melting indictment of the dangerous state um, of violence in the political present. Plasma students watched the film in preparation for Adam's talk today, so much of the discussion may revolve around that formally and politically provocative film that was released last year um, in 2019 before the historic protests, police murders, and other right-wing violence. He's at work with Bailey on a new feature, uh, Nosferasta, um, and he received a, they received a Creative Capital grant um, in 2021 uh, to complete that uh, film or work on the film. And the description is um, enticing. So I thought I would just read it, which is that this new film uh, is described as spanning 500 years of colonial destruction. Nosferasta tells the story of Oba, a Rastafarian vampire and Christopher Columbus, Oba's original biter as they spread the colonial infection through the new world. So that was in uh, process and I'm sure Adam, or maybe Adam will talk a little bit about where he's at with that. He's also working with, um, as part of NR, NRO on a commission project at the Wexner Arts Center, which Chris Stoltz mentioned um, in the second talk of our series. Um, I'll place that link as well as the link to the screening event um, that Squeaky Wheel has organized for April. Today, he'll be talking about the development of his work between and across media, politics, art, and film, refusing to hew to any one medium or approach. He's an artist who works in a variety of modalities in ways that challenge us to consider how the power of art can be harnessed to subvert the present power structures and to facilitate collective practices that can help imagine and build the world otherwise. So please help extend a very warm, but muted microphones, welcome to Adam Khalil. Hey, hi everyone. <laughs> thanks so much for that introduction and thank you all for having me. And also thanks for everyone for checking out the work. And also I was privy, Paige shared with me the questions you all wrote and they're really great and really cool to see what was resonating and what wasn't. And I just also wanna, before I launch into things, say, yeah, I'm the one talking now, but all of these works are involving a lot of people and they're collaborative. Uh, but there's just want to like acknowledge my brother, Bailey Jackson, Suzanne Kite, a large cohort of clown collaborators who I love dearly and who make this stuff together. And also just thinking how meaningful collaboration is, especially when finding one's voice artistically, because you get to learn so much from other people. I feel like filmmaking is way too hard to do by myself. I couldn't do it. Um, and that the two heads is better than one thing is very, very true. Uh, 
oh, I got to, sorry. Ani Bojo, Shingwa, Kandishna Kaas, Babating, and Donjaba. That's like my official intro. But Adam Khalil, originally from Northern Michigan, but in Brooklyn. Um, yeah, sorry. I might play a clip real quick to kind of set the tone or mood. And then I'll be right back. Where are we? I didn't see that. What a surprise. I don't remember inviting them. It's great that you joined us. Yes, welcome. I don't remember inviting them. Let's not worry about that right now. You're right. At least they're here now, or they're back now, or maybe they never left. We never left. Right. We never left. We never arrived either. That's right, Jim. As settler colonists of the so-called United States, we have long wondered how to be here, how to leave, and how to arrive. Have you ever wondered how to be here, how to leave, and how to arrive? Probably not. Us settlers have long taken for granted that we're living on stolen land and are actively participating in a colonial regime that seeks to oppress, suppress, destroy, and assimilate indigenous culture, land, bodies, sovereign governments, and epistemological ideas. Don't forget, it's not our fault. We were born here. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. We were born adjacent to it. It's not our fault. It's not our fault. That's the beauty of it. We are actively engaged in the colonization of this land, but it feels like a passive process. It is a passive process. I didn't ask for this. We didn't ask for this. You didn't ask for this. They didn't ask for this. It's not our fault. At least that's what it feels like. How it makes us feel is really all that matters. It's like empathy. Exactly. And like capitalism. It feels alienating. Well, after all, we are an alien nation. Built upon the foundation of an Indian burial ground. Feel good intro. Just also thinking about land acknowledgement practices and trying to figure out this is something we've been thinking a lot about in our work. But maybe also to relate it back, because I think most of y'all checked out Empty Metal, uh, and one of the devices or techniques we're using is direct address, where we're actually like communicating to the audience members or the people who are watching the work. And I think that's something that I haven't thought of until recently, but is actually coming up over and over again. And I think part of the stakes for that is thinking about how people consume media or movies and how we as artists or filmmakers have an ability or agency to kind of directly reach out in that way, even though like sometimes it can be a little much, but maybe in times like this, a little much is just enough or not even enough. I don't know. I think that's part of the thing we're figuring out. I might talk a little bit about empty metals just also to put out there that it was an experiment and in the sense it was also like journeying and thinking through big questions about the role of politics and art and if art can be political or make change and i don't think we've ever resolved that or will resolve that but it's the question that we keep circling around and it's also yeah would be curious and again thanks for the questions that were super thoughtful uh just thinking about 
like we started shooting that film in 2015 um, and there was like tons of movement happening for the murder of Eric Garner and a bunch of other folks. And just thinking about how at that time in the streets, the idea that abolishing or reforming the police seemed like a fantasy that would never be possible. And then like six years later, it's part of the discourse and the dialogue. And I think that's also part of the utility of art is creating that kind of speculative political thinking. And, but that's, I'm not at all saying <laughs> empty metal had anything to do with that. But I also just think like the more these things come into discourse and dialogue, there's a way that they can be kind of conjured into reality, just in this, in this way that's intangible, almost like telepathy. Uh, and I know there was a bunch of questions about the telepathy, but I think part of that is what I'm trying to get at is that like throughout, well, I guess because of my background of being raised in an Ojibwe community, thinking about political struggle as something that's generational, where I feel like often there's a hope that we can see change in our lifetime, but also real change takes many lifetimes. And thinking about being like one part in a larger wheel that's pushing those things past all of our lifetimes. Um, so that kind of continuity or chronomorphic scale is a way to also be thinking about the things we're trying to approach and the telepathy being this like, like the underground left or like insurrectionary movements are always have a kind of magical quality to them because they're defying all the odds and that in an age of total surveillance, maybe a somewhat magical form of communication like telepathy would be required to move things forward. Um, and also if people have questions at any point, super down to just take them or throw them out there or something's not making sense. I also have a tendency to mumble. So if anyone can't hear me, just be like, hey. <laughs> but now I'll kind of like backtrack a little bit and kind of like place my own personal practice in relation to all these collaborations and just kind of like painting a picture of like my first passion and interest was experimental film and then got really deeply invested in documentary and had always kind of talked shit about narrative films as like this kind of sellout form of filmmaking uh, and you know said I would never even think about doing that but then through my collaboration and friendship with Bailey started seeing how it's actually a really powerful form because it's what a lot of people watch and thinking about how we could try to structure something kind of like a Trojan horse where it could like look and feel like a movie but have all of these other things embedded within it. And that's something we still haven't figured out but we're still pursuing and that's part of the Nosferasta push which will also be a doozy if it comes together. <laughs> um, But one of the reasons I switched over into being really interested in documentary was me and my brother thinking about representation of native people in documentary and thinking about the history of documentary. So like one of the first recorded images ever is Thomas Edison uh, and it's the Sioux ghost dance, which is like a group of native actors performing a ghost dance, but they're not actually Lakota. It's actually just a constructed image for an audience. Um, and then thinking about like Nanook of the North which some people say is like the first major doc um, and how that film, because the original footage was lost, was actually like reshot very similar to a narrative film. And me and my brother feeling this kind of frustration about how documentary has a kind of proximity to truth or is like claims to be moving towards some kind of truth. But in reality, the history of it has always been kind of restricted and constructed in a way to contain certain truths. Uh, and it only shows the truth that's in the frame. And then if you think about editing as a way to manipulate truth, it's just a very slippery slope. Uh, but also part of that obsession of indigenous people in the center of the frame to be consumed by another culture or community is something we wanted to resist. And I'll just play a teaser trailer for me and my brother's first film, which is kind of a response to that line of thinking. Uh, a little bit about the title. Well, no, nah, I'll play the trailer. Cool. Two seconds. Oops. 
It is from understanding that power comes. And the power in the ceremony was in understanding what it meant. I saw more than I can tell, and I understood more than I saw. I did not have to remember these things. They remembered themselves all these years. So it's just like a little taste of that film, but also maybe just to unpack it a little bit is a uh, part of it was thinking about how also history is told in documentaries and moving image art and it being really funny because where I grew up, like going to public school, they would send us to like the local history museum, which had totally bogus stuff about our tribe. The town I grew up in was like 50% native, 50% white. So it was like half the kids were like, what? Uh, and that there is like this alternate form of history that's the seven fires prophecy which is part of an oral tradition that's about our tribe's migration from the east coast to the great lakes and then even further uh first contact and kind of predicts and predates the settler colonization that emerged out of that encounter um but the other really cool thing is because it's an oral tradition it can get changed um and i think we were trying to figure out ways of updating that prophecy to a contemporary moment. And we kind of had some inspiration from this Ojibwe painter, Norval Morso, who worked a lot in the 60s and 70s and was like referred to as the Picasso of the North. And for all intents and purposes, was like the first native contemporary artist. So like showing stuff at galleries and museums and not in uh, anthropology museums or like other kinds of contexts. Uh, but this idea of taking something and then updating it, making it useful, having history and storytelling and narrative having a utility to the present moment, as opposed to a kind of like dogma or a rigidness about it, which also in this post-truth era is also slippery in a different context. And I think a line we're trying to walk, but it was also just trying to like create space to share our version of our understanding of the history that we're from. So that film is like very personal for me and my brother because it's about where we grew up uh, and involves all of the community members that are our family and mean the most to us. But then we kind of played ourselves because we made this film where it was like all about our community, all about expressing agency and control over our own understanding of history. And then it was being shown to mostly settler audiences and not really being shared with indigenous communities. Like we did actually like tours where we went around different reservations in Michigan and Minnesota and Iowa playing it in those contexts, but most people saw it when it was playing at museums or film festivals and realizing actually like the kind of anthropological impulse to share information was something we were playing into while trying to resist at the same time and really trying to think critically about how not to fall into those kind of traps of performing representation uh, for, for, for consumption. And that's kind of where the New Red Order stuff started to emerge because we met a collaborator, Jackson Paulus, who's a planet sculptor and artist and he had been working on this idea of the new red order and kind of willingly taking on the role of being an informant not having it something not having it be something that sneaks up on you <laughs> but just being like okay like we're native artists we're operating in this context so we're going to inform on our communities a bit in order to also like create space and open dialogue for settlers to inform on their desire for indigeneity and actually one of the questions that kept popping up was about the, uh, like, I think someone was like, I'm Mexican American is the new red order for me. Or like these ideas of uh, intersectional solidarity. And I think that's actually what's really 
one thing I just want to make clear is that the desire for indigeneity also comes from indigenous people. Uh, and I think we're actually trying to collectively all together investigate what's up with that and not do a finger pointing thing about like that's wrong desire that's inappropriate, even though that stuff is gross and really frustrating when people are in headdresses or want to meet medicine men sometimes. Uh, but I think that's part of the perspective and angle is also creating dialogues where conversations can start happening where it's not focused on like whiteness. Uh, and then also trying to be really careful and develop language around settler colonization because there's a lot of like lateral violence that could happen within that. And also, I guess, maybe more specifically, like thinking about how inherently conservative that kind of thinking could be. Like one understanding of decolonization or land back could be like kick everyone out, which is just like some of the most repressive, shitty politics about nativism. <laughs> Um, and I guess part of what the NRS is trying to do is like create kind of a think tank to think through those things collectively and in dialogue. Um, and there's a lot of humor in that, but I think there's also a deadly serious nature or a hope that hmm, I'm rambling a bit, but I'll, maybe I'll switch back over. So it was like, we made that film. We realized we were starting to actually be like kind of, uh, digested within our own portrayal of where we're from and what we were doing. Um, but one of the through lines in that film is like also a uh, kind of critique and understanding of how places like anthropological museums function within indigenous understandings of the world. And something that I think we thought was interesting about it as a site is because the majority of people, I mean, I love museums and I think most people think museums are good. <laughs> and we wanted to kind of complicate that by Kind of pointing to the fact that some of the impulses in museological practices are actually really terrible for people um, but it's like by doing that in a site that's kind of ubiquitous and everyone's familiar with the idea of a museum and being like it's not just land it's also stuff it's also people it's also cultures um, and this is a short film we made in 2017 that's also kind of a proof of concept of a larger feature film me and my brother are working on right now, specifically about repatriation or rematriation. And that's when um, indigenous groups get their ancestors or indigenous human remains back from archives and museum collections to bring them back to their communities for reburial. Anyways, I'll play this film, it's like nine minutes. And it's kind of like, I'm doing the chronological thing. It'll make sense soon. Thanks for bearing with me. <laughs> One morning in 1784, Thomas Jefferson became America's first archaeologist when he decided to indulge his curiosity and unearth human remains from an Indian burial mound. Since that day, archaeologists, anthropologists, amateur explorers, and hobbyists have collected and sent thousands of boxes of indigenous human remains to museums and universities often in the hope that they would become the objects of scientific study and help prove widely held beliefs about indigenous racial inferiority, or to prove insight into an alternate history that the first people in the New World were in fact European. It was one of those things no one ever doubted. The first people on this continent were the Indians, period. No reason to believe otherwise. But two summers ago, in the town of Kennewick, Washington, a skeleton turned up that could turn out to be the missing link between what we thought to be the truth and what actually is the truth. A truth, if it is the truth, that the Indians are not happy with and would just as soon leave well enough alone. The story of Kennewick Man started out like an ordinary murder mystery. 
two young men made news when they found a skull on the bank of the Columbia River near Kennewick, Washington. Suspecting foul play, they called the police, who thought the skull looked very old. They were right. Anthropologists excavated the area and found the full skeleton and determined it had been carefully buried along the river 9,000 years ago. One of the oldest intact skeletons ever found in North America, a scientific treasure. Prosopopoeia, prosopia, prosopopoeia. Noun, a figure of speech in which an abstract thing is personified. Noun, a figure of speech in which an imagined or absent person or thing is represented as speaking. Human remains are the kind of things from which the trace of the subject cannot be fully removed. Their appearance and presentation in the courts of law and public opinion has in fact blurred something of the distinction between object and subject between evidence and testimony. You could put this one in a crowd of, of Native American skulls. I mean, you could put him in with a hundred of them and you'd still pick him right out of the crowd. His skull shape falls way outside the range for modern Native Americans. But I'm asking about the central question of concern. Who was here first? Doesn't he already challenge that? He challenges it. He challenges it. He does. Misplaced guilt is too heavy a rucksack to carry about. But our ancient roots on this continent give us position as good as or better than any, one that is not a settler mentality, that we are not newcomers, that we are not interlopers, that we are not evil conquering Europeans, but that in fact we have ancient, ancient roots here that give us a right to say we too are native peoples, we too are first peoples, we too are indigenous to this soil. We have our roots here, we will not surrender, we will not be swept from this place. We will instead sink those roots, deepen those roots, not be transient, but instead truly inhabit this place. Forensics is, of course, not simply about science, but also about physical objects as they become evidence. Things submitted for interpretation in an effort to persuade since objects do not speak for themselves, a person or a technology must mediate between the object and the forum to present it and tell its story. In U.S. court, the remains of the Kennewick man are considered objects. Each bone and other piece of property was contested ownership. And only forensic anthropologists have the authority to speak for them, to tell their story. But for the Columbia Basin tribes, the Ancient One is an ancestor. His bones were unearthed from Indian land, so they speak for themselves. We know what happened 10,000 years ago. I know what happened 10,000 years ago at home along the Columbia River because my teachings from my older people tell me how life was 10,000 years ago 
and the scientists cannot accept the fact that just because it's not written down in a book, it's not fact. It's fact to me because I live it every day. as a trophy case to exhibit the settler colonial power's most prized possessions. Everything is turned into an object and a display, no matter what it is, no matter if it is a piece of the earth, an ivory tusk, the shell of a tortoise, or human remains. The entire museum's practice speaks of the terrible impulse of domination, a sort of indiscriminate domination nothing escapes the collector's impulse, as if our entire linear and accumulative culture collapses if we cannot stockpile the past into plain view. Memory is not a container for information, but a perpetually emergent process. one of the things I wanted to kind of maybe touch on is this idea that pops up in a lot of the work, which is thinking about a kind of distinction or difference between the ideas of information and knowledge uh, and how information, well, I personally feel like information should be shared and should be accessible. And that's a way we can all learn more about this world and the people who are in it. But knowledge has a different quality to it, a different kind of patina to it. And a lot of times it feels like knowledge is something that has to be given or earned, or there has to be some kind of uh, process to, to attain it. And that was also like a lot of our hesitation and frustration with a lot of contemporary doc practices where they, you want the sound bite, you know what I mean? So you go into places and you pose questions that are leading in order to get the little bit of audio that you need. <laughs> uh to tell the story in a way that's coherent um and thinking about how that is an extractive process similar to like resource extraction or other kinds of extraction um, and especially like i was talking about earlier the history of documentary and how it's a, that extraction of knowledge has really been focused on indigenous communities uh, i think that film kind of gets to those things or like what's the utility of secrecy like guess i'm just maybe trying to make a link between that and these ideas of like telepathy and secrecy and surveillance and empty metal as well. Um, 
where there's like a different there's strength in secrecy uh but there's also like an impulse to share and that's the kind of tension i feel like a lot of our work is struggling with and against uh, just something else too because and I noticed a couple of a lot of the questions not, uh, were talking about the music choices, and they're pretty funky. Um, but then also thinking about like how music is traditionally or it can be used sometimes like unthinkingly in films because it's such a powerful tool. So it's like if you put happy music over a shot, it all of a sudden feels ten times happier, you know. Or if you put sad music under a shot, it's ten times more sad. And how it kind of for me, I don't like stuff like that because I feel like I'm being manipulated, but like the filmmaker hasn't earned that kind of manipulation. Um, so thinking about using music and sound as a way to unsettle what people could be, making people struggle with it and through it in order to think critically while it's happening, while the thing is unfurling. Um, and I guess also like in terms of the structure of editing in Empty Metal, that happens a lot too where it's like, you'll see the effect, but not the cause, but you'll see the cause later. So it's like setting up these kind of like puzzles or games within the edit. Um, and that's something that I love when I see that, because I feel like I can really dig into what someone's doing in the work. Uh, but it's also a risk because you can also lose people. And I guess the thing we're also constantly trying to juggle is thinking about audience and audiences. And we're aspirationally hoping to reach many different audiences on many different levels so like some of the work like or the trailer i showed for it not to say like in that film like like i said there's this conversation happening with our community and so like if you're from there you'll understand a lot more of it but we're also structuring it in a way where hopefully people have no idea about any of this we're still like offering the audience a hand that they can hold on to up to a point and like i guess the other thing about music too is like thinking about the, the overall structure of the stuff we've been trying to do, like each individual piece, thinking of it as like a musical composition in some kind of way. Like there's parts of like a chorus or a bridge or a verse. And there's also tempo changes that happen a lot. And I'm obsessed with the tempo change going from really serious to really irreverent or going from really slow to really fast. And these, again, because it's like unsettling, you can't just kind of sit there and let it wash over you. I hopefully, you know what I mean? like the viewer hopefully there's space for the viewer to become like an active participant in the act of viewing it and also that's the beautiful thing about filmmaking like i have all these other interests but filmmaking is like this amazing container because you can put all of your interest into it <laughs> like uh yeah it just i'm so thankful to have found this medium because i don't know how to write I, there's like it's just it's it's for me <laughs> Because you can take all this stuff that you're reading or like you go to a show and you hear certain sounds or like uh, you go to a museum and see a painting and all that input can actually come into the, that one container of the film. Um, so this, it's almost like a way to like present research and interest in some kind of ways or like as a dialogue. That's how I'm working with that collectively. And maybe that's part of the, why it's collaborative too is because it's, there's an attempt to like have a dialogue emerge within it and then also that the, the work would spawn a dialogue outside of it as well. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, humor is really important for us because a lot of the stuff we're talking about is super traumatic and difficult and also has an ability to easily slip into self-seriousness. Um, and thinking about like a lot of like traditional social issue documentaries, there's always this goal of constructing empathy, but then thinking about how potentially slippery and scary and messed up empathy can be as an emotion to understand someone else. Like, why would I need to put myself in someone else's shoes? Why can't I just listen to what they're saying uh, and have that be just as real as if, yeah. Mm. Uh oh, I'm rambling. I took a note. Oh, yeah, but that's why humor is nice about it, because a uh, nice way to get through that stuff, because it also helps in terms of like uh, the unsettling nature, like people aren't sure, like, is this a joke? Is this for real? But maybe that's an opportunity for people to think through things more because they have to be confronted with figuring that part of it out on their own. 
Um, but I also worry sometimes that this stuff can slip into irony in a way that's uh, potentially not what we're trying to do necessarily. Um, and it's a tricky balance, and especially also thinking about the multiple audiences too, and like how things react and interact. And like with the New Red Order stuff, like there's no indigenous people in the work, but it's like about indigeneity. And I think that's actually really important. So we're not put in a position of performing that again and again and again, because for some kind of approval or like interest or desire towards that. Uh, and then also thinking, we've been working a lot with Jim Fletcher, who's a pretty amazing actor, performing, performer and artist. Um, and just thinking maybe that people could listen to what we're saying differently if it's coming from like a 50 year old white guy than if it's us saying it. And what are those kind of slippages that happen? That's part of this idea of proxy is that like we're unloading the representational burden onto other people who are allies or accomplices. Uh, but then that's also tricky because there's the whole thing about native erasure and presence. So trying to balance those things at the same time. Um, moving around a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe I could play another another clip. This is part of the speculative furthering of uh, the violence of a civilization without secrets. It's like a new platform we're calling culture capture. Um, let me put it up here. Oops. in Connecticut or almost there. Police in Connecticut are increasing patrols after vandals spray painted two statues, one in Middletown, another in New Haven. The vandalism was posted online. Video shows a man striking the base of the monument with a sledgehammer while someone holds a sign next to it that reads, Racism, tear it down. And another person narrates the video. Back here at home, a Columbus statue in the capital city has also been targeted. You can see the red paint spray splashed all over it. The statue was covered to keep the graphic scene from the view of visitors. That there is the Christopher Columbus statue that was vandalized yesterday. Now, police tell us what you see there is red paint. Now, we're not sure who did this, when they did this, or why, but this comes amid an ongoing debate over Confederate statues across the U.S. Just a few days ago, just a few days ago, just a few days ago, just a few days I'm Jim Fletcher, award-winning actor and reformed Native American impersonator. I'm an accomplice to indigenous people, and for the purposes of this video, you can think of me as their proxy. Images that represent the settlement of this land unconsciously inform our inability to comprehend our settler reality. The presence of Indian bodies outside made of marble, stone, and bronze often signifies the presence of Indian bodies inside, 
made of bone, brain, hair, heart, and lung. These monuments conjure terrifying realities. Do you think these Indians are real or imaginary? Signs like these conjure realities and create national identities. The society of statues is mortal. One day, their faces of stone crumble and fall to earth. This botany of death is what we call culture. And this is how we capture it. Some pretty bold culprits to pour what police are calling fake blood on the statue of Theodore Roosevelt outside the Museum of Natural History. The latest iconic monument to be desecrated during Mayor de Blasio's public debate about symbols of hate just happens to sit under the watchful eye of this NYPD surveillance camera. I feel ashamed when I see it. It's a horrible symbol of our time today when we are acting out in ways that are uncivil and impolite. The statue, dedicated in 1936, features the former president to stride a horse, a Native American on one side, an African on the other. I empathize with people who are upset about things, but I don't think choking paint is the way to do it. Leftist groups have been demanding the statue's removal for months, saying Roosevelt, the former Rough Rider, former NYPD commissioner, former governor of New York, and former president, was a racist. I just think that they should uh, express their protest in a different way. Vandals have also desecrated other monuments, including the statues of Christopher Columbus in Central Park and in Columbus Circle. Spokesman for both Mayor de Blasio and the museum insisted vandalism has no place in the public conversation about monuments now going on.
Hey. Those uh, people in the street interviews at the end are super funny to me, especially in the context of the present day. And again, maybe some of the savage philosophy that we're hoping to put out into the world. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to think what to, yeah. It's a lot of stuff. Do people have questions or? There's also this amazing question, but um, yeah. Um, I uh, have a question. So it's about like the sound design and the stuff you've, stuff I've seen. Um, you, th it's most prevalent in the one you've shown before this one. Uh, you use like kind of droning sounds. Yeah. Like, you know, like humming or, and it's not like actual humming. It's more like, like mechanical-ish. Um, what's uh, what's the thought process uh, behind uh, using sounds like that? Totally. Yeah, actually, I have a little, a lot of actually that drone music is all from the same composer. And it's this musician, Elian Radik, huh. who's such a badass. And like basically is like one of the early uh practitioners of analog synthesizers um and their compositions are like usually an hour long mm. and listening to her music by itself i've had like psychedelic experiences so i feel like a little tacky to keep putting it into the movies but it's also so good i just mean it's like a full thing on its own uh and we yeah. partially like also in empty metal there's a composition she made that rides out underneath the entire film and we just like raise and lower the levels but it's always constant and present yeah part of that is this idea of like creating like a bed that the film can then sit on um and that yeah that music has this kind of like for me anyways this like unsettling quality but also this kind of ethereal and compelling quality that for me i keep getting drawn into it almost like getting kind of hypnotized by it but it also, I know, is grading for some other folks too. And that's the tension we're walking in terms of that line. But uh, yeah, I highly recommend Elion Radik. They're, they're the GOAT. Uh, and it was really cool. Another musician we collaborate with a lot, Leila Bordeaux. Uh, like Leila's hero is Elion Radik. And Radik and Leila have been in touch recently. She gave us approval to use the music a couple of years ago. And it's just been awesome to have that kind of intergenerational collaboration even though she's not making music for us but she was down with the work it was like, <laughs> hey, you, i was just going to ask you adam would you put their names in the chat yeah. i might need to check that, that one last yeah, i must have spelled it wrong with my bad. And then the other thing too is a lot of people in our kind of social circle or friend group are musicians too. So I think it's always about mm -hmm. keeping our ears open with them uh, and taking bits and pieces and forging relationships where people feel comfortable sending us stuff, knowing that we'll chop and screw it and excerpt and clip and mush it all around. Mm -hmm. um, but also actually like making the soundtrack for MC Metal was one of the funnest experiences ever because it was Layla and then her collaborator, Doug, and me and Bailey kind of like locked ourselves in a basement pre-pandemic and just kind of had to start making a new language. Like, could you do more of the whoa, 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 whoa? Like <laughs> developing this like nonsensical shorthand that actually started to make a lot of sense by the end of it and started to become like this weird hybrid sound language. Um, and I guess that's the other thing about like, yeah, the film is container is like also like, it can also be a container for friendships and collaborations in that way too. Allowing space for people to bring their talents and their interests into the fold. All right, uh, thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah, if other people have questions, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, I was just going to ask, since you were kind of on the topic anyway, I was really um, interested in 
Yeah, I know you've talked about it a little bit, but collaboration, like, you know, um, maybe how you came to collaborate with um, Bailey, and I know you collaborate with your brother, and just, um, obviously, that's very important to you, but maybe talk a little bit about um, how some of those relations, like, came to be, and, and um, yeah, like, what, what has been fruitful about that? Full disclosure, there's some clevers in the room next door. So if there's some shuffling, apologies. <laughs> but, uh, with my brother, I've known him for a really long time. Uh, we have similar life experiences. Uh, most movies I've seen, he's seen because we watched them at the same time. <laughs> um, but that's Zach's background was in music and mine was more in film. And then we collaborated on like, like my senior thesis and he did the score for it. Uh, and that was how that started but then with enough to say that was like the first time we actually worked together and more personally like and not to say was also like our mom was someone really important to our tribe and worked in education there and kind of like, had like an open door policy and she passed away and not to say was like a way for us to reconnect with where we're from and also to kind of process the grief and anger we felt about losing her um so in that way it was also like very therapeutic and like really meaningful to do go on that journey with Zach together um and I feel like yeah the journey and vibe is also kind of true for Bailey and I's collaboration where we really we were and are still really struggling with like what's the role of art what's the role of activism uh how can these things be melded or merged or like is this just navel gazing or like and really wanting to push that into some we're organizing we're doing other things outside of that you know what i mean but there's always this tension around that and i think yeah it's really it was a way for us to explore those questions in tandem and have that dialogue back and forth but then also all the people in empty metal are like close dear friends like even so yeah actually uh king alpha the older rasta guy he's writing those for us that with us right now and then the bald monk guy is my roommate pavel and then the band are our best friends. It's just a very, yeah, there's like one block in Brooklyn that like half the cast of Empty Metal lives on. <laughs> and that feels really good to also be making things almost like a family or something. And there's like tensions that happen and arise within that. But it's also because like none of the people in that movie are actors. So we're also trying to write parts where they can play themselves or a tweaked version of themselves. Uh, but also like that interplay and those conversations around how far to push that with them has really built up our friendship and also I feel like built up some of the some of the woo woo I don't know like the the energy that goes into it. the collaboration oh sorry I was just gonna say to follow up on that one of the um yeah, so the that idea of like that the proximate intimate collaborations that you create through the films and projects, but then I'm also thinking about the way that you, that direct address you use is about inviting right accomplices, right, and how you see that if you where you see that line of like is there um, Liz Park just put a great question about your use of the word container to talk about film. And she asked, you know, do you, could you use that for other mediums or monuments or museums? But I'm even thinking, does the collaboration function like a container to where it has an edge? Because what I find amazing is that of that gesture of New Red Order wants you, right? And that as an accomplice, right? And the, the question about where edges around collaboration um, you know, yeah, you know what I'm asking, yeah. <laughs> no, that's super juicy. And also, uh, yeah, I almost feel like the collaboration aren't containers because they actually spill out into each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like Bailey also was one of the four co-directors on a lot of the NRO work. And there's like this flippage around that where he's become a full accomplice by like also helping produce the stuff. Uh, like my brother was involved in empty metal in different ways. And like. I think I know it's getting good when the research interests across all the projects start dovetailing. There's resonances across them, 
And that's when I'm like, oh, okay, this is heating up now. This is gonna work. Um, but that's also like the benefit of having that container of collaborations because then you can pull from each other what those resonances are. Um, yeah. Yeah, the container is a weird one. I think I like it for a film because I feel like you're just filling it up. It's like seven minutes or an hour and a half. And you're just like pouring stuff into it until. <laughs> Actually, Bill and I were talking about films as soup a lot because there's all the soup and empty metal and thinking like in a good soup, each bite should be the same, but slightly different. Like it has to have enough of different kinds of ingredients mixed together. I guess maybe it's more of a stew. Mm. But then it's the, the part of like stirring all that together, and like how mm. each of those individual ingredients make the whole tasty. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I just thinking to extend the metaphor probably too far is that then there's also the fact that other species, right, can smell differently, right? So they can smell the different ingredients in different ways, right? So just thinking about dogs, you know, they don't smell soup as a whole, they smell it as little parts, yeah, right? Yeah. And that idea that that's, it's we, what we smell, what we taste, they're, they're differentiated, right? And that we all, right? Yeah, it just, that, that metaphor is probably not great, but the- no, I really like it because yeah. it's also about like audience then. Like, yeah, like, exactly. That's, that's super cool. Wait. Yeah. But I wanted to just go back to this question that are here just about Liz asking, are there other things that are containers, um, monuments, uh, museums, other mediums um, that you, yeah. Museum as container really resonates, but also I think part of what we're trying to do with the work is also present a museum as a prison in the sense of like there's different epistemologies around what's animate or inanimate and something that could be viewed as an object is actually a subject because it's an animate being from a certain understanding and the fact that it's being kept makes that kind of a prison container in that way um the monument thing as a container is pretty interesting especially because like that piece terminal edition that we showed where it gets all blobby and stuff we've continued down that path and uh kind of like melting down the monuments using cgi animation or morphing them or defacing them but not in a way where it removes them or destroys them but in a way where it's like a, an additive approach and that was because there was like this new york city council three years ago that kind of met up to figure out what to do about problematic monuments and statues and really amazing people were involved with it, but ultimately their recommendation was an additive approach, which meant putting up a plaque for context, um, which felt really insufficient because it's like, no one really notices monuments anyways, a lot of the time. So most people wouldn't even give a second thought to the plaque next to the thing they walk by all the time and don't think about. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, someone else is asking about like if film is a better container than others. I just think for me, because you got sound, image, text, like you can just dump all of it in. Whereas like I'm not a musician, I like playing music, uh, but I really don't know what I'm doing. So I actually don't even know like how to communicate on that level. But like people I know who are musicians are out there in conversations and they're improvising or like writing songs together. Uh, I just don't have that, that skill set or background or able to speak that language to develop something that could be communicated with that as a container. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also the idea that you have that it's it that it is research, communication, all of these things at different levels, right? That's also one of these potentialities of film that's so different than other media, right? And that it circulates right way you know can move way far away from you you don't have to be the informant next to it right you don't have to be in it you don't have to right that that enables a certain kind of freedom to let it go totally and i think also because like movies tv moving image also has a proximity to entertainment there's something nice about kind of taking up that space or trying to take up that space to like have a different register one of the jokes i don't know if people have seen that movie they live by John Carpenter. It's a classic. I highly recommend it. But there's like the glasses. And like when they have the glasses on, they see the message behind the ads. And when they have it off, it's just an ad. But we were kind of talking about 
aspirationally, that's like what we're hoping the new red order does. <laughs> so it's like in New York City, like the city seal is everywhere. It's like every food grade, every cop car, every school has a Lenape guy and a Dutch guy. But like I've never really seen it until <laughs> like thinking through this stuff. Um, and people who have been involved, accomplices or informants who've been involved with New Red Order have like came back and like, I'm seeing it everywhere now. Like it's so ubiquitous. And that's part of why we're phrasing it as a public secret society, because there's this anthropologist, Mick Tausig, who's writing awesome. Um, he writes a lot about this idea of a public secret, like this thing that shapes our society that we don't really acknowledge or discuss, but we all inherently know. Um, and thinking of that as like a cool jumping off point to create some contradictory woo-woo in terms of public secret society. Cool. Um, yeah, and then in the chat too, Stephanie was asking um, to hear more of your thoughts on the neoliberal appropriation of indigenous spirituality, for example, what is positive about it and when does it need to be disrupted and how? Yeah, it's interesting because actually like that's what we're going to be working on today. <laughs> we're working with the uh, Kite, who's this amazing artist, on a project about Lemurians, which is like this theory that emerged in 1890 that there was like Atlantis and Lemuria and they uh, predate humans um, and through some kind of mutual assured destruction they both vanished but there's a few Lemurians left and they live inside of Mount Shasta um, this is getting out there but part of the interesting thing about it is like it's similar to the white supremacist guy in violence who's talking about we've always been here our roots are here where it's like creating this alternate mythology or history to justify some kind of erasure by saying, well, like, there were people here before that too. There was like the seven foot spirit beings that live in the mountain that were here before that. Uh, so we've been going more into that uh, neoliberal appropriated spiritualism and it's pretty sticky territory. I, yeah, I guess that's part of what we're struggling with with New Red Order, to be honest, is like giving space for that stuff, even though it's really difficult and frustrating. Uh, but just thinking about like the desire people put towards indigeneity, there's like so much untapped potential in terms of like if that desire was redirected or rechanneled or retooled to actually be in service of indigenous people as opposed to the extractive thing. So I think that's that's the kind of fine line we're trying to walk around that and then the other thing too is like we're also in this time right now there's the right things to do and wrong things to do and that seems or feels weird for me a little bit because I didn't get into art to tell people what's right and wrong uh like I have a perspective when I'm like sharing it and um but that's what also the the, the taboo nature of some of this stuff is really appealing to me because it's also this kind of like idea of flipping things on its head to see it right side up. Uh, but yeah, maybe in a week I'll know better about the neoliberal spiritual stuff because we're in the thick of it right now. <laughs> cool. Um, and then Hadi has a question in the chat. Uh, in a lot of your works that involve museums and the commodification and objectification of indigenous culture, you portray the audience and spectators, the actors in there as wearing those masks um and then like she says they appear as mindless consumers which kind of relates to your they live reference um and then she was just sort of asking about the symbolism behind or the choice behind that yeah, yeah i think that the consumerism angle is definitely there it's actually part of like a larger part of the new red order like after you join you have the option to get an anonymized silicone mask made for you and then once you have the mask on you have anonymity and protection to kind of perform your deepest and darkest desires towards indigeneity in a safe space, a safe space for unsafe ideas. Um, but that also like goes back to anthropological obsessions with masks and what kind of transformation that can happen with them. Uh, but also outside the consumerism part of it, it's also like the horror of it and showing this thing that's very, like people walking in a museum, it's like that's not horrifying, but then from a certain perspective it can be. So in some ways it's like very literal. We're just trying to like literalize that. Plus I think they look kind of cool. Jackson made them. They're goopy. Goopy's cool. <laughs> cool. 
Oh, I don't know when that Lemurian film will be finished and what the title is. But I think, oh, actually, we're supposed to show a chunk of it in September, but we still got some time. That's why it's all up in the mix right now. Will you spell out the Lemurian um, into the chat? My, my Google skills are not so great today. Yeah. <laughs> spell it right? Yeah, it looks right. Other questions? People want to unmute themselves, raise their hand, ask questions. Do you want to talk? A, oh, I was going to say, do you want to talk a little bit more about empty metal and the process of making it? And totally, yeah. yeah. That's something I'm really thankful for. I came up with this term "friend tour," the friend mentor. But Peggy Alish was one of those people for me and really encouraged both Bailey and I to do filmmaking backwards. She's like, don't do the thing where you write the script, shoot the film and then edit it. Like you just corner yourself more and more and you're kind of stuck with this like chunk of text that becomes a chunk of footage that becomes a chunk of a film uh, and taking a kind of more nimble approach of shooting, editing and writing all at the same time, which makes the process much longer. Like there's a utility to that script shoot screen uh but you also can miss out on a lot of opportunities if you take a more idiosyncratic approach to that and like so empty metal we shot it over four years and it was really just like applying for grants asking the rich people we knew for two thousand bucks like clawing enough resources uh piece by piece to do like a five-day shoot and then when we do the five day shoot and edit it and realize like, oh, why? This is where the film needs to go. Like we need to include this storyline. This needs to connect to that. And those things would become really obvious. Whereas like if we were just doing it on the page, like writing it out, I don't think we would have ever gotten to some of those connections and stuff like that. Um, but it's really also kind of an awful way to do it because like our friend Austin got a haircut. Of course he did. You know what I mean? Like, can't ask someone to maintain the same hairstyle for three years because you're sometimes making a movie with them. <laughs> and then it was like, okay, like now we have to buy a wig and I have to learn how to put a wig on my friend. It's like, okay, let's do this. You know. What I mean? <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, and I think also I'm really into this idea of the filmmaking process as this kind of journey. Uh, and you don't necessarily know where it's going to go or land, but also that the film wants to be something on its own and also like fostering and growing the things so that way it can be on its own. Uh, from just put the um, conversation of you and Peggy in there. Yeah. Peggy's also like a vampire expert. So she's been helping us a bit with uh, the Nosferatu script. Like she knows every, every vampire ever. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> Someday we'll have Peggy will come for, for plasma. Um, we tried to bring her when, when Tony Conrad was still alive, um, but it didn't work out. But we'll definitely have her up here. She's amazing. Really yeah. Other students, there are lots of questions about making and like how the working with the, the style of working of editing and empty metal, a number of people ask questions about that. But are there questions you actually want to ask the audience? Anyone to kind of respond to or? A lot of no. the new Red Order stuff is new. Ha, ha, ha. So it's also like curious how people felt about the level of sincerity or humor. And that was what was cool reading the questions was starting to get kind of a read about how people were either taking it as satire or like confused by that, but also just kind of interested 
to hear more about that because that's in process. But no pressure. <laughs> We may be quiet. Um, we shot on a red camera. No, I'm just kidding. It's like that. <laughs> That's the classic. I guess I can also just kind of offer like uh, my own experience, just thinking about everyone in school and then after and how daunting and scary that can be. Um, but there's always a way to figure it out. And like, actually, like, I learned a ton about editing and production after school because I was working at a bar mitzvah videography company. <laughs> Me and my brother both were. And that was kind of like this boot camp where we were also like scraping by making a living, but also doing it like in the real world. I mean, obviously, it's not very prestigious to be making bar mitzvah videos, but it was an uh, amazing, actually, learning experience. I just, encouraging folks to try that out or like I guess that's the thing I love about films it's like no one can master it it's like constantly figuring it out and there's all different stages and times and processes for that but that like anytime there's an opportunity for that like you're only as good as your next movie you know <laughs> yeah no Right, that the experience comes in all forms and it, it can all feed your, um, the next step, the next thing, your, inform, you know, your perspective. And like you said, also your voice. I think that was also a really important thing about not being afraid of collaboration as a way to find your way in the world, that it's not about being actually, uh, you know, monad um, somewhere to make your impact. But that, in fact, it's that you're you're finding more the more you encounter. I mean, I think even the film itself uh, enacts that, right? In terms of empty metal, I'm just thinking about how these encounters with images and things, all of your work uh, across all of your collaborations, really enacts that um, fearlessness in terms of uh, um, encounter, right? Like that, nothing's off limits. It also helps because it's collaborative too. Because again, I don't think I could do that on my own. Right. Scary. No, and yeah. right. The energy, right. The energy so, uh, comes from that, right? Like it yeah. doesn't come from you being like, I'm going to be experimental, yeah. but it's more like, I'm going to be open to this and, yeah. and struggle with it, right? And be um, challenged, right? Which oh, is part yeah. of why also New Red Order is such an, an, an like a, a funny, but also such a, incredible gesture, which is like, you know, meet us, right? Join us, yeah. right? Which is also, uh, you know, vulnerable too. Hopefully yeah, that. yeah, I think there's a certain, you know, in yeah. talking about your style too, um, that, you know, there's, we've talked before in this class about um, like limitations and restrictions and stuff. And like you're saying, you know, shooting a movie over five years and like, you know, trying to apply for grants and shooting it when you can uh, is really, is really interesting. But I think, yeah, there's a certain really cool style that comes out when you do, you are facing, you know, limitations and restrictions and you're relying on each other to, uh, you know, come up with uh, ideas about uh, how to how to make something work, you know, um, within limitations of you know footage you might have or you know money that you have to shoot something. So um, there's something really cool that that comes out there too. I think maybe kind of anecdotally riffing on that too, because I knew there was a couple of questions about the CGI stuff in Empty Metal, uh, and actually I stole that move from Peggy because Peggy was making these series of works with Taiwanese CGI news animation. They're pretty trippy and kind of amazing. But then she was downloading them and cutting these kind of like dream logic narrative shorts that are awesome. And then that kind of, we've downloaded a few clips related to the thematics of our film and put them in. I was like, oh, that feels pretty good actually. <laughs> like, is that cool? She's like, are you appropriating me? Like, yeah. It's like, okay, cool. It's fine. <laughs> like, just also this idea that like, yeah, the energy and the openness to it too goes both ways. 
That's why it's also like really good to watch a lot of stuff too. I feel like because you can, like I feel like a lot of filmmaking is theft, <laughs> like in terms of ideas or people's time. Or <laughs> just thinking about like yeah, filmmaking is super exploitative, like, and there's no real way around it. <laughs> like, I guess the last couple of years I've been coming to terms with that, like wanting to do things like ethically and right care for people while doing it but also not kidding myself around like the amount of resources that it takes and like the amount of people's time that it involves and you have been talking for an hour and a half so <laughs> Are there any other questions? People want to unmute themselves and ask anything? You've been amazing, Adam, really great. I'm so glad we got to share more of your work um, and the students got a chance. But are there questions? I really want to give people a chance. No? It's a lot of stuff all at once too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so they'll be writing this week to, in response to you and have time to, to, to do a little more digesting. Um, but uh, I'll put again the link for the um, the April 7th to April 8th uh, screening from Squeaky Wheel um, when Adam and Bailey's film Empty Metal will be available on Squeaky Wheel's website, um, web interface, sorry. And um, uh, yeah, and I'll also put in uh, information about um, uh, the Wexner Center project too. So um, great, thank you so much, Adam. And uh, really um, excited to have had you here. Yes, and next time you'll be here in person. That's the last step. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. No, but thank you for real. It's really meaningful to also unpack this wacky trajectory and be in dialogue and engage this way. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay. So have a good night. Well, have a good afternoon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll see you all later. Have a good night. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so just posted that last uh, thing and then I guess we're done. Okay, did you, let's stop.